now here ah it works so thanks for this uh, complete uh, introduction and for uh, the kind invitation to talk about uh, uh, a practical guide to the characterization of fluorescent proteins so i was uh, i've been um, firmly asked to uh, present not uh, my results but uh, rather um, something like uh, really practical to for, for you guys to uh, be able to know what to do with your fluorescent proteins and how to characterize them so um, i hope it won't be too boring like uh, uh pour five microliters in that uh, to yeah uh, and push on this button but at least it's very very practical and uh, so you won't see a uh, huge uh, big images uh, of uh, super resolution images or uh, structures and everything because I was asked uh, not to do uh, history or uh, fluorescent proteins uh, of fluorescent proteins and so on uh, but I still did a bit uh, because <laughs> <laughs> so about fluorescent proteins um, so as you saw uh, during uh, the different uh, previous talks. Uh, GFP was observed, so it's a very quick uh, uh, history because it was first, obse well, it was first observed uh, thousands of years ago, uh, but uh, uh, observed really uh, as a protein in 1962 by Osamu Shimomura uh, in Japan. And he then uh, wrote at the end of his uh, uh, lab, lab, lab book uh, that there's a protein giving solutions that look slightly greenish uh, in sunlight. Uh, and only yellowish under uh, tungsten light and exhibiting a very bright uh, greenish fluorescence in the ultraviolet light uh, but also uh, has been uh, uh, isolated from squeezates so s squeezates mean uh, juice of jellyfish <laughs> because he, he took uh, he took this uh, jellyfish that you heard of uh, before so it's uh, aquaria victoria uh, and in fact uh, we always say that uh, it's uh, shining uh, in fact it's only this uh, region that is shining here it's called the umbrella uh, and th th there are those specialized uh, um, light organs here uh, about a hundred per uh, umbrella uh, that uh, produce very few amounts uh, very little amounts of uh, uh, GFP so if you want at, at this time in 1962 uh, it and even uh, after because it was purified first in 1979 so at this time uh, Osamu moved uh, in US <coughs> and, uh, and at a place where he could find plenty of uh, jellyfishes and he, he there was no cloning uh, techniques for uh, for having a lot of uh, uh, proteins so he was obliged to have these squeezades indeed and so he um, uh, uh, mm, created uh, what I call the jellyfish nightmare machine so in 1974 for example that's uh, uh, Osamu Shimomura and his uh, family and friends uh, uh, and they were fishing like 40 buckets a day of jellyfishes so they were really uh, uh, devastating the, <laughs> the the ocean and they they were coming to this uh, to this plate to uh, um, cut uh, the umbrella and uh, they were well, dropping the all the rest and uh, make squeeze aids from this uh, umbrella and extract light organs and try to find which kind of protein was inside uh, so uh, it was finally uh, identified as, as a clear protein and with development of uh, uh, molecular biology as you heard from uh, Dominic uh, the first day uh, uh, Osamu Shimura gave the, the, pr the, the, the gene to Doug Prusher uh, who was able to uh, really uh, identify uh, uh, which gene it was and to clone it and he gave it to Martin Chalfi uh, who gave it to uh, his PhD student and she uh, was asked to try um, putting this gene uh, in another uh, organism. So she tried uh, E. coli and it was a complicated story, but uh, long story short, uh, it was a success. And finally, she was the first uh, ever. So that's a page of her lab book. It's always I uh, show lab books uh, ju just for uh, for you to, to see that it's important to have a good lab book and to uh, it could finish uh, in presentations in a few years. Um, and that's the first ever photograph of, uh, of um, uh, GFP fluorescing in something else, in another organism, than uh, jellyfish. Uh, so, uh, but during uh, this year, so 1992 until 1999, so that's seven years of green only, so uh, uh, only only GFP. So uh, it was, of course, uh, put in Cenerabditis uh, uh, elegans, as Dominic said, and it made a the first uh, the cover of uh, science and for the 
the small story, uh, science didn't like the color, so, so they asked uh, Martin Chaffee to uh, change the color uh, because the green didn't look like uh, didn't look uh, nice on the on the color, so he firmly refused, and uh, it was a good idea because uh, and um, and since uh, they could identify the different uh, nerve cells uh, of um, uh, the this worm. It was uh, during these uh, seven years cloned in almost everything. So in uh, uh, Drosophila, in uh, as uh, Hide showed, <coughs> Hideaki, sorry, showed <laughs> um, small uh, fishes, uh, but even bigger animals. Uh, so even cats. So a lot of uh, different animals. So everything was uh, shining green and E. coli, obviously. Uh, but ah yeah, it was uh, still interesting. It was it wasn't just for fun. Uh, it was also uh, important, uh, like uh, you could track uh, cells or uh, organs during uh, the development of uh, diseases. For example, in these uh, uh, nude mice, mouse, uh, you can identify uh, proteins expressed in, in nesses, uh, such as cancer, uh, and you see that uh, either in brain or in the liver, directly uh, in vivo. So it was already a good, um, and it was as early and as uh, 2000. So it's uh, it was already very useful, but uh, in '95 everything changed with the improvement uh, thanks to uh, molecular biology of the GFP, uh, thanks to uh, uh, the late uh, Roger Tsien, uh, and he developed the first variant of the GFP. So that's S69 65T, uh, so known as the GFP, uh, and uh, whose chromophore matures faster. There was further developments afterwards, uh, and especially uh, the crystal structures of the GFP and the EGFP uh, that occurred at the same time, and uh, many variants uh, appeared in the following years. So I tried to make uh, um, uh, phylogenetic um, uh, tree uh, from the GFP, uh, so with all the mutations that that were made. To so you know uh, some of them, uh, probably the all the YFPs, the CFPs, and uh, their sons, so uh, Cerulean, MCFP, and so on, blue BFPs, and uh, developments of, of them. There was even uh, even rediscovering of uh, CFPs from yellow, from green. So you see that there was a lot of uh, uh, a lot of developments, and even uh, the first types of um, uh, photo switchable uh, variants of GFP in yellow and in green. I will talk about that a bit later, and um, that's just for. Uh, Looking good, uh, and in and uh, after all, in '99 uh, uh, we could use another color because, uh, as uh, Jörg said, uh, as early as in 1997, uh, Jörg suggested that the red color from uh, anthozoan organisms, so in especially uh, corals and uh, anemones, uh, could come from uh, uh, GFP-like protein. So, and in '99, uh, Russians, these guys here, so you have uh, Sergei Lukanov here. Uh, Arkady Fratkov, uh, Mikhail Matz, and uh, Yuli Labas, I didn't, didn't put it in the correct order, uh, had the idea to seek uh, FPs in non bioluminescent uh, organisms. So it was a indeed a crazy idea, and especially uh, this uh, um, uh, disc anemone, so this cosoma, uh, to search uh, for uh, fluorescent proteins. And there was one uh, called DS Red. And in 2002, Robert Campbell uh, monomerized this. Well Everyone knows it because uh, we said it uh, several, several times, but in two uh, M MRFP1, thanks to 33 mutations. Uh, and in 2000s, uh, so we ended with two fluorescent proteins uh, that revolutionized the way we could observe living cells because uh, Roger Sian changed the, the well covered the whole palette of the GFP from blue to, uh, to yellow and uh, DS red from yellow to red. So we had everything, which is here between these ends. And that Dominic showed uh, during his first presentation. That's what it looks in uh, um, ambient light and uh, in uh, in fluorescence. So here you have everything, all the names that you know. Uh, and it was, of course, uh, awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry uh, in 2008. Uh, from that, uh, people started to uh, look everywhere, and uh, um, KD was the first uh, photoconvertible fluorescent proteins that were fin fin found in uh, uh, in 2002 uh, in uh, stony corals. So stony corals are the one that uh, build uh, coral reefs, uh, and especially in this one uh, called the well, I didn't write the name. It's called the uh, Trachyphilia uh, geoffrey, I think, um, and it was 
shortly followed by uh, EOSFP uh, that you probably know of, uh, by uh, discovered by uh, uh, Jorg and Uli uh, Ninaus, uh, and that's from uh, Lobophilia and Priki, Dendra by uh, again Russian people uh, from uh, a soft uh, coral called uh, Dendroneftia, and that's um, uh, one example of what it uh, could uh, develop uh, as a technique. So G here you have two different proteins. Uh, GFP and DS red, that was what you had at this time, so green and red. And now with the same protein, uh, for example KID, so that's measurements I made in uh, Leuven, uh, you can completely uh, convert and have the equivalent with wha one single protein. And uh, as uh, uh, Ide showed, Ide Aki, oh sorry, uh, <laughs> you, you can uh, have these uh, um, uh, neurons here that are un undistinguishable uh, in terms of network. And uh, if you shine uh, a lot uh, on this uh, one and a few, uh, well, li little on this one, then you can identify uh, the different networks of, um, of uh, neurons. So that's the photoconversion uh, as seen as um, spectra uh, in absorption. So that's the green uh, absorption of the anionic state and that's the red forming in time. So note that you have an isosphistic point here meaning that you have a one-to-one -one, uh, conversion. Uh, in 2004, a drone pa uh, was uh, uh, created, so not found because it's not uh, natural. There's no, um, to my knowledge, there's no natural uh, uh, RSFP, so meaning uh, reversibly switchable fluorescent protein, I think. Uh, so it was identified uh, first as uh, the protein 22G in uh, echinophilia. I should have written the name, sorry. Um, and uh, further developed into a uh, drone pa. So uh, here, the, uh, that's a real switcher. So again, uh, it's a one-to-one -one, uh, conversion, but between uh, a, a protonated state of the chromophore, so the, the tyrosine that Dominic showed you uh, the first day, the tyrosine of the chromophore is uh, protonated at the end, and it's uh, uh, turning uh, into, uh, well sorry, it's the opposite. When you uh, shine with 488 nanometer, it's uh, the uh, anionic form is depleted to uh, the protonated state of the chromophore. But uh, the news is that it's uh, totally reversible, um, well, modulo the, the, the bleaching, of course, uh, to uh, the initial state. So it's a real switcher, you switch on and off the light, and that's made uh, many, many times here, uh, so uh, with uh, these shark fins uh, uh, experiments. Uh, so that opened the way to uh, new types of uh, fluorescent proteins called uh, smart uh, fluorescent proteins because they were able to make uh, more than just shining. And uh, as uh, several people told before, uh, there are several types that are represented here. The PAFP, so photoactivatable fluorescent proteins that can ir uh, irreversibly turn from a non-fluorescent uh, state to a fluorescent state. Can now we have uh, several colors. We have green and red, for example. Uh, PCFPs, photoconvertible fluorescent proteins that turn irreversibly uh, because it's uh, a bond cleavage uh, to uh, another color. So we have uh, cyan to green, green to red, which are the most uh, well known, uh, and uh, orange to dark red. And we have uh, RSFPs, so uh, reversibly switchable fluorescent proteins that can be s split in two families negative RSFPs that are the most well known. They are initially uh, fluorescent in one color and can irreversibly uh, toggle to toward uh, a non-fluorescent state. Um, positive switchable uh, fluorescent proteins, so that's the exactly the, the opposite. The most well-known is uh, Padron. And well, this particular case, uh, of uh, which is called dry clung, uh, that you heard of uh, the, first, uh, the first day, uh, which is uh, also uh, uh, reversibly, but uh, thanks to chemical uh, uh, change because I didn't tell you yet, but it's uh, it's not chemical here; it's physical change. Uh, and uh, this uh, biphotochromic uh, that uh, Hideaki uh, mentioned, uh, so it um, combines uh, PCFP and RSFPs, and that's what I developed uh, a few years ago. It's not the, <laughs> the initial year; uh, it's uh, like I don't know, 13 years ago, uh, with uh, Uli Ninaus uh, and Karin Ninaus and Jörg Wiedemann. Uh, that's Iris FP and further on uh, with uh, Hidaki, uh, that's Niji FP. So they they combine both states uh, irreversibly, uh, uh, rever reversibly switchable in the green, irreversibly converted to the red, and reversibly in the red. 
that's the corresponding photo transformation uh, that occur on, at the level of the um, uh, chromophore. So the PAFP undergo a, a cleavage of this uh, uh, glutamate that is nearby the chromophore, and that induces a change of protonation uh, in the in the chromophore, uh, which is uh, uh, then uh, uh, well bec activated to uh, to a green state. The PCFPs that's also a bond cleavage, uh, which mechanism is uh, quite debated, but uh, it forms a double bond here. Uh, usually you have a histidine and that's forming a, a more conjugated, a longer uh, conjugated system in the chromophore. Uh, so it fluoresces uh, elsewhere in the, in the in energy. And the RSFPs, so that's a cis isomerization of the chromophore, so that's totally uh, reversible, uh, uh, providing that you choose the correct uh, excitation wavelength of each um, uh, chromophore um, form. Um, and that's correlated with a change of protonation of the chromophore, which is also uh, reversible. Okay, and now uh, that's a well, that was a state of the art uh, a few years ago uh, uh, of the existing uh, fluorescent proteins, so that's uh, conventional boring uh, <laughs> fluorescent proteins that just uh, shine, and you see that uh, we cover the whole palette of color, and that's uh, PTF is a phototransformable for some proteins, whatever they do. Um, so they are mostly engineered, and uh, you see that, in fact, uh, we are biased by the fact that we we have a lot of green fluorescent protein existing at the origin, and we want to go as far as possible uh, to the to the red, so to make, uh, for example, uh, uh, in-depth uh, tissue uh, imaging or these kind of things. And in fact, we forgot totally uh, to uh, develop a uh, yellow here you can see uh, the occurrences. There's no no yellow fluorescent proteins uh, that are phototransformable. Uh, so that's a further uh, development that we should uh, maybe uh, focus on. And uh, going to the practical aspect, uh, that's the kind of uh, phototransformation you can first uh, try to follow in phototransformable fluorescent proteins. So I took the example of uh, uh, our common protein uh, with a uh, Hidaki uh, NID GFP where you can uh, directly in real time follow uh, the spectra, the absorption spectra, uh, depending on the excitation uh, light um, uh, on and off here. Uh, so then uh, NIGI is a similar protein than Iris FP, but not on EOS FP, on, on Dendra 2. And you, you can make that many times, so you see that there's a small loss of uh, fluorescence uh, in time, and that's photobleaching. And when you decide, you can uh, strongly eliminate uh, the protein, and that photo converts to the red state. So that's exactly the same protein, huh? same sample, uh, that you can uh, photo convert to the red state, like that, irreversibly. And when you decide it, you can photo uh, switch the red state uh, by choosing uh, other wavelengths here, because uh, it's all sh shifted to the red, uh, again, many, many times. So that uh, is uh, useful for uh, advanced uh, imaging uh, capacities, oh, uh, experiments, sorry. And about quality control, let's, let's say that you want to produce a protein, a fluorescent protein, and you want to check if it's a good protein and, uh, and check all its uh, possible um, uh, charac characters. You want to characterize it totally. So I guess that uh, you're pretty uh, used to that. If not, uh, please uh, ask me questions. But that's everything that is very, very common for all, uh, for all proteins, except that you have the advantage that you can see uh, the protein all along uh, the process. So that's very convenient. You never have to, uh, to take uh, measurements or, or, uh, or gels or whatever to know uh, if your protein is, your is in your fraction because you see it uh, directly. So you uh, pick a colony and you put it in... Um, uh, wha what I do is that I put it in an uh, autoinducible medium uh, to grow it uh, very efficiently. Then I pellet my uh, cells and uh, lies. Uh, I incubate directly uh, my protein uh, once I, I centrifuge uh, all the uh, all the membranes. Sorry, I directly incubate uh, with uh, any cephalos uh, beads, and then uh, make uh, an IMAC, so a nickel uh, column, a gel filtration, a fractionation of all my uh, samples where I choose the best, uh, the, the purest ones. Um, put it in a tube, and then uh, I have my protein that I can check uh, whether it's fluorescent or not. It's quite obvious. And uh, another SDS, and um, uh, ultimately, but you're not obliged, you can uh, crystallize it and make uh, further uh, 
uh, experiments. That's all okay for, for these steps, right? Okay. Even for the uh, autoinducible medium, it's all okay. When you know all. The what is it? No. No? I oh, know. You want to know? <laughs> no. Yeah? Okay. Good then. Because <laughs> that. that <laughs> That allows you uh, to do something more interesting that instead of uh, waiting and taking all your samples uh, and follow their uh, uh, absorption uh, during uh, hours and hours uh, with your I IPTG uh, pipette. Here it's really for lazy people. Uh, you just have to uh, put one single colony in, uh, in how many liters you want of uh, uh, medium, so it's not LB. And and leave, and when you come, uh, your protein is uh, ready. So it looks magical, and the principle is that instead of using the IPTG, you're using the good old um, uh, cleavable uh, lactose. So you you put enough lactose for the the proteins to be uh, happy and uh, inducible. Uh, once they they would have um, uh, eaten all the the first sugar they, they prefer, which is glucose. So you put a good mix of uh, glucose and lactose, and they will. Uh, go and eat all the glucose and, and grow. And after uh, the glucose is all finished, then they will go to the lactose because there's no other choice. That, that's, that's their uh, second preferred uh, candy. And, um, and they will uh, then uh, be induced uh, because it's lactose. Uh, so they stop grow growing and they will produce uh, massive amounts of uh, proteins. So um, I tried to uh, make a better uh, uh, recipes, but that's my best secret recipe. So don't tell anyone. Uh, but um, uh, I tried first to uh, really uh, induce much more, uh, like uh, making a kind of uh, terrific broth uh, equivalent. But it's not a good idea because uh, there's so much uh, sugar and, uh, and uh, yeast extract and this kind of thing that the, the protein just grow and never uh, induce proteins. So the idea is to prepare uh, different uh, media, uh, so an equivalent of LB, uh, which is just tripton yeast, ex yeast extracts in these uh, proportions. Uh, you'll, you'll have my, my slides because uh, I see that you're copying. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then you prepare um, N NPS, so that's just the, the uh, NPS here, S. Um, so that's just a mix of salts uh, the, the bacteria are happy with. Uh, then uh, uh, we, we prepare uh, this uh, amount of sugar, so it's glucose, lactose, glycerol, so plenty of sugars, and uh, another salt uh, that's just, uh, yeah, well whatever. And you autoclave auto uh, everything but this one because it's sugar, so you'll just have caramel instead of uh, having it. So you just, that's very important actually, uh, you just uh, filter it with 0.22 micrometer. Uh, filters. Uh, the rest is uh, autoclave and then uh, you just mix it in this proportion, the D-day, the day you want to um, uh, produce your protein. Uh, so you, you, f you prepare uh, as many uh, liters you want, that's just given for one liter. You put these uh, amounts of uh, antibiotics of uh, selection, so usually it's uh, for bacteria, it's either uh, canamycin or ampicillin, uh, or equivalents, carbenicillin or these kind of things. And you inoculate a single colony uh, in a 500 milliliter in a lot of uh, air, and you agitate as strong as you can. No, not as strong, but uh, 200 RPM, which is quite uh, quite strong. And you go elsewhere. And um, and the the, f the well, 24 hours later, you come back and you have plenty of. Uh, that's not not even uh, 24 hours later. That's just overnight. Plenty of um, of proteins. It works really. Uh, sorry. So, so it depends on the on the on the vector, of course. Uh, the best vector uh, we found uh, currently is uh, PQE31, uh, which, for the protein we are currently uh, working on, uh, produces a uh, uh, do you remember a 300, uh, 300 milligrams per liter. So it so, so it works. <laughs> And that's a uh, that's a convenient thing because we are l working a lot on in XFEL, so X-ray X-ray free electron laser, uh, and we need we need uh, grams of crystals, so really really a lot of grams of uh, proteins and uh, yeah that's a, a lot of work for that. Uh, yes, where is it going? <laughs> Sorry, uh, BL twenty one DE three yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, so let's assume that now you have your protein, uh, you so you broke your uh, your cells uh, and purified and everything. You have your protein in your tube and you want to uh, characterize it. So the quality check is to uh, state the, the well the to check the, the oligo oligomerization state uh, and of course the spectra. It looks obvious, but it's not that uh, obvious, especially the oligomerization state. There are many ways to uh, probe that. Uh, of course, you can uh, make uh, native gels and compare them to an uh, SDS page uh, um, and well, estimate where it is, but it's not a good estimation. And, and that's given uh, uh, at a given concentration, uh, the one in, in the gel. The analytical gel filtration uh, works as well, it's w but it requires to be very, very precise on the calibration of the gel filtration column, but it's, uh, it's working. Uh, native mass spectro spectrometry uh, works as well, but I know nothing about it, so I won't tell you. And the analytical ultracentrifugation, uh, that's uh, how we do it since, uh, <laughs> since my visit in Leuven. Uh, so it works uh, very well, so I will tell you about that. Uh, and the spectra you'll see after. So about uh, analytical ultracentrifugation uh, analysis, you have two ways of doing it. S first, you need to have an uh, AUC, of course, uh, <laughs> nearby. But you can do it either uh, by uh, self-association uh, analy uh, analysis. So it means that the protein concentration has to be adjusted at one given um, concentration. So typically, it's uh, 0.1 to uh, 0.5 of optical density at the maximum absorption of, the of your chromophore in a one centimeter cuvette. So you just take a spectrum of that. Uh, and you uh, run, uh, so it's a long time, of course, it's 22 hours to 24 hours at uh, something like 40,000 40, uh, Gs. And uh, you have this uh, formula, uh, which is not that complicated because it's a uh, gas constant, uh, you know, here. You have uh, the Rs that are the radius of your uh, turning machine and, um, and the concentrations of your protein. Uh, so that's how the protein uh, behaves uh, if it's a monomer, and then you uh, increment that uh, by adding terms to. Uh, so if it's a dimer, you add no yet no another term with uh, this uh, association con con coefficient between uh, um, well the the monomer one and number monomer two, and if it's a tetramer, you add yet another term with uh, monomer one and monomer, monomer four in the in the other direction, and so on. So that is uh, easily made by a, a computer, and you have uh, already free uh, um, uh, softwares that do it, this uh, analysis. And that's uh, an example of what you can get. So that's uh, this time uh, we tried to compare uh, several uh, proteins, so iris of P, uh, another uh, version, uh, which is a monomeric uh, form of uh, iris of P. Dendra 2 and NGFP, and we saw uh, the different, because we wanted to check whether it's, it was monomeric or not, these uh, proteins, and IRIS-FP is expected to be a tetramer, uh, but uh, in fact, the fact is that the first generation of uh, monomeric form of uh, EOS-FP uh, were always found uh, tetrameric in the structures, in the crystals, and so we tried to understand uh, at which state it's it became a tetr tetramer, and we, uh, so you have the different, so these uh, equations give you the different comp components of each uh, participant, so monomer, dimer, tetramer, and you can extract from that at, uh, at any given uh, con concentration here, you can plot that, and have uh, the, the monomerization, dimerization, tetramerization of each protein, and see how it behaves in concentration, and choose which protein you, you want, well, if you improved, the monomericity, meaning at a given concentration, if you form uh, less mo uh, dimers, then you have better protein in terms of uh, uh, usable tag uh, for your cells. Uh, for example, those ones are the best we had because uh, even at very high concentration, it forms dimers. Uh, while these ones, these two ones, even at, at moderate concentrations, so moderate concentration meaning mean uh, uh, physiological concentration. So that's uh, the region shown here in yellow. So that's uh, this type of concentration that you can find uh, uh, in a cell. So it doesn't mean a lot because it, it's very uh, different uh, on the well the local concentration can be very different, of course, uh, in, a, in a cell. But still, uh, you can expect these proteins to be mostly monomeric uh, in at physiological concentration. But still, in uh, in concentrations you find in the crystal, so in the crystal structure, when you want to analyze your protein, you'll find again uh, tetrameric structures. 
So it doesn't mean that your protein is not monomeric in, uh, in cells. Uh, and but still, these ones, we you, you, you may prefer them because uh, they will behave uh, longer on, on a longer range as monomers. Right? Ah, not really. Uh, I'm not sure, but the my personal experience showed that in two different uh, labs where I used uh, two different uh, techniques of uh, analytical centrifugations, we had an analytical, analytical neutral centrifugation uh, device and not... Uh, so that's maybe, <laughs> maybe the reason. <laughs> so, for example, I... Ah, yeah, yeah, that's... Indeed, yeah. Yeah, 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 it's true that we can go very, very high, yeah. Uh, the other uh, way of doing it is by uh, changing the concentration uh, and probing the concentration all along the, the tube. Uh, so that's a, a tube of um, uh, analytical centrifugation with uh, what is called the meniscus here. Uh, and you, f you track uh, at different concentration all along the, the, the gradient. And so at different times, in, in fact, uh, the, the signal you, you have. So you have here time one, two, three, four. So you can make that many times. So that's what we did here for uh, another protein that I developed called uh, RS folder that you'll hear about a bit later. And uh, the analysis, so you can find all the free uh, softwares uh, at this uh, 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 URL, which is quite uh, well uh, called. Uh <laughs> uh, and it, it, it will fit you all these uh, different times and concentrations because you know the initial concentration you put. Uh, in the in the tube, so that's uh, a rotor that is uh, going fast, and the UV light is going through uh, there, and so you just analyze uh, with the detector uh, the, anal the 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 fluorescence light, uh, uh, and uh, all these uh, the absorbance light, and all these uh, um, different times uh, are fitted, and will give you a component which is uh, in fact a sedimentation coefficient in Zvedberg. And here, for example, it's 2.5 Zvedberg for all the proteins we tested, and it's, uh, it corresponds to a monomer. So what, whatever the concentration that were probed here, uh, it behaves at a, at a, at as a monomer. So that's another way of doing it, depending on, uh, on the preferred method uh, the analytical centrifugation people uh, will have. Good. Spectra. So spectra are about uh, getting excitation absorption and emission maxima and spectra uh, of your protein and gives you a very different information. So most of the time excitation spectra are forgotten by people who are working on uh, uh, fluorescent stuff um, and they take uh, absorption and emission. But for example, in these two uh, extreme uh, cases, which are two very commonly used uh, proteins, so derivative of uh, EOSFP called MEOS2 and the derivative of uh, Dendra called Dendra2, um, you have very different uh, shapes of uh, absorption spectra, as you, uh, as you can see. And uh, now that you've seen all the, all the different talks, you know that this is the protonated chromophore. So it gives you a lot of information, in fact, here, because you know that this uh, protonated chromophore is uh, higher in, uh, in Dendra 2, so it means that the pKa of the chromophore must be higher. Uh, if you measure the two uh, uh, spec set of spectra at the same pH, but also that they won't participate to uh, fluorescence because you don't have uh, excitation spectra. Um, if you zoom here on the top, uh, you have this uh, maxima, uh, so it's really zoomed, but uh, you have uh, al also uh, other information, like uh, the whether you have an uh, ipsochromic or bathochromic shift, so a blue or red shift, uh, between your proteins. Here it's a, a blue shift for Dendra 2. Um, so that's Im also important for uh, making the good correspondence of your uh, laser setup uh, if you're imaging, for example, uh, your sample. The stock shift, uh, which is the, um, the spectrum shift, uh, spectral shift between the ex excitation and uh, uh, the absorbance and the emission, sorry, which is uh, wider for Dendra 2. And as I told you, the pKa that must be different. So the qualitative appreciation of the protonated uh, fraction 
uh, and thus the chromophore uh, PK uh, and thus the excitation uh, coefficient, the extinction coefficient uh, at a given pH, because if it absorbs less here, uh, it must mean that uh, the excitation uh, coefficient, uh, the extinction coefficient, sorry, of the uh, uh, anionic state must be lower, because the state is in the other state, the protein is in, is in the other state. So how useful is my protein? Then, once you've made uh, this uh, uh, first quality check, uh, you have to go uh, further and make all the battery tests if you really want to m to know whether you had a a better protein or not, better mutant. Uh, so that's all the different uh, steps I'm going through uh, each time, actually uh, each cycle of uh, engineering. Uh, so the expression, the folding, the maturation, the excitability, the brightness, the and the phototransformation uh, quantum yields. That's for one cycle. If you m want to make, for example, a, a directed evolution, uh, you'll have to uh, engineer and come back to uh, maybe the structure, see what changed, and come back for yet another cycle and so on. Uh, so um, so uh, everyone told you that it's important to take care of uh, uh, the maturation, the folding, uh, and but how to measure them. So uh, I will uh, illustrate my uh, presentation with this uh, example where we made uh, most of everything. It's a protein uh, we were interested to develop. Uh, because we were interested in seeing interactions between bacteria that interact directly uh, one to the other uh, through uh, porins, so uh, through uh, membrane proteins. And since they were uh, interacting uh, each other uh, by uh, physically, we couldn't put uh, fluorescent proteins uh, on this side, so external. So we had to put it on the other side, so meaning uh, within the bacteria, but between the two membranes, it's a gram-negative uh, protein, so we had to put it within the periplasm. So we say, well, no problem. Uh, let's take this new uh, uh, protein uh, that just uh, well, is brand new. Uh, it's um, uh, RSEGFP2, so developed by uh, uh, Stefan Jacobs uh, in Göttingen. And let's go for that because it's uh, really uh, photo um, uh, well, photo resistant and everything, so it looks perfect. So let's uh, express it in the in um, in the periplasm, and we'll be able to make uh, super resolution imaging. Um, so we, that's what we did. First, we tried to express it in the cytoplasm and then in the, in the periplasm. And in cytoplasm, it worked like that, so perfect. And then, so we uh, engineered the protein, well, we, we fused the protein to uh, um, a sequence of uh, secretion to the, to the um, periplasm. And we imaged again, and uh, we got that. So uh, by, um, that's a real image, it's not a bug. So uh, by uh, pushing the, the, the brightness to its uh, limit, uh, we get that. So we see the proteins indeed, uh, but we uh, admitted that it was a kind of failure. Uh, so we tried to find another way of doing it. Uh, and we uh, came back to uh, all that. So that's the major translocation pathway of bacterial proteins within the, bacter the bacterial uh, periplasm, and um, when the uh, uh, ribosome uh, translates uh, a, a protein, it can either be uh, co-translocated uh, thanks to the signal recog re recognition particle uh, process, so it, it's ca it can be uh, co-translated uh, uh, trans and uh, secreted to the periplasm, or first po um, trans uh, produced uh, translated and then uh, go uh, in, uh, in the periplasm thanks to either uh, the sec or the tat. So in that case, uh, the proteins are completely folded and go through the pore. Uh, for our case, it was uh, completely unfolded and had to go uh, afterwards uh, to the periplasm. And we said, oh, maybe that's a problem. Uh, and the protein is unable to uh, fold properly in the periplasm. So we went uh, back to a paper of uh, Philipp Tinfeld, who um, uh, said exactly that that uh, when your protein is uh, is going through the the, the membrane and go to in inside the periplasm, it works well when it's going to uh, tat through tat when it's completely folded before. Uh, it, it works well for a superfolder GFP because it's folding fast, but it doesn't work for EGFP. Uh, so RSGFP2 must uh, act as a EGFP. So we went back to a uh, superfolder GFP, but which is a, a very strong uh, fluorescent protein uh, developed by uh, um, uh, uh, many cycles of uh, directed evolu uh, evolution. 
but uh, but which is not uh, able to do a super resolution microscopy. So we said, oh, no problem, let's make it switchable. So we uh, took the robust uh, architecture of Superfolder GFP, so we kept most of the uh, interactions between all the, the different um, uh, amino acids within the beta barrel, and we uh, introduced the key uh, mutations of RSGFP2 inside, and after a set of uh, optimizations, so that means codon optimization for both human and E. coli, so that's a trade-off uh, expression, uh, COSAC sequence if ever we want to use it in, uh, in, um, in mammalian cells, uh, C and I termini, termini uh, optimization for fusion, this kind of thing, so that correlates with what uh, Hideaki told you about uh, having a good linker. Uh, we ended up uh, eventually with a RS folder, which we hoped to be both robust and uh, um, uh, reversibly switchable. So to, ha to have taken the, the best of the, of the two worlds and not the worst. Uh, and we tried first on uh, bacteria, uh, so that's a bacteria co ba bacterial colony where we put a 488 uh, nanometer uh, laser uh, on this region and then a 405 and up, came back to life. So good, we continued and uh, compared to uh, what I showed you before, RSGFE2 in the cytoplasm and periplasm, RS folder uh, works very well, uh, as you see, you can see uh, really well the periplasm this time and that there's even a, a further a developed version which is called the RS42 uh, that seems to work <laughs> uh, less good but in fact it's it has better properties for uh, other, other things uh, and we could uh, in particular uh, uh, resolved which is uh, one of the many uh, different uh, super resolution uh, microscopy uh, techniques that exist so RS folder was unable to do it uh, because of uh, too fast switching and too bad contrast uh, we used the uh, RS folder 2 and this time it works. So you have the here the, um, uh, the encounter of uh, two different bacteria that you can see here, but it's uh, you have the two uh, the, the boundary between the two bacteria and uh, at uh, conventional microscopy resolution here. And here uh, at after resolved uh, processing you see or maybe you don't see but uh, the here you, s you can see, I hope. You can see better, I hope, uh, resolved the two layers here that you can uh, see on these uh, profiles. Uh, there's always two layers that you can see at uh, conventional microscopy. So it's able to make a super resolution. And now, uh, what about the expression level? Does it express as good as uh, RSGFE2 uh, in, in, a in a given condition? And the condition that we were interested in here, it was the periplasm, meaning a very oxidative uh, uh, compartment. Uh, and uh, with different pH and everything, and maybe uh, temperature, we, you might you might be interested by different uh, uh, things. So here, that's how you you can do it. So you for each clone, uh, a single colony, uh, you you have to uh, inoc inoculate with a single colony, five milliliter of autoinducible uh, medium again for the same reason before, and tw at 25 uh, degrees, and uh, and put in wa 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 well plate uh, after well. Uh, after all, uh, 100 microliter per well, and you follow both the uh, absorption at uh, 600 nanometer for uh, following the bacteria growth and uh, the fluorescence, so the peak intensity uh, at 37 degrees. So you follow both the development of bacteria and the production of proteins. And uh, with that, you can see uh, uh, here that's in black the um, the production of bacteria. So the in this lag is the the induction time so it takes the taxi time I the time it takes to uh, to be uh, really uh, uh, growing so that's the multiplication of bacteria so it works well uh, each time that the protein is in the cytoplasm uh, and in the periplasm it doesn't work well because uh, at as soon as the protein is expressed in the periplasm for RSGFP2 the fluorescence drops uh, because in fact the the protein is clogging the the periplasm and the bacteria uh, die. So by making fractionations of your uh, bacteria, so separating cytoplasm and periplasm, you can estimate uh, the number of uh, the, the brightness per, per uh, cell. So you just divide the two value, uh, 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 so fluorescence per OD unit, uh, and you plot that, and you see that it works well uh, everywhere in the cytoplasm, better for, uh, for the f first two. 
than uh, RSGFE2. And uh, in the periplasm, uh, it doesn't work at all for uh, very very badly for uh, RSGFE2. So it correlates what we see, what we've seen before, but with numbers this time. Uh, and after this uh, fractionation, you can also uh, make uh, uh, isolate the contents uh, and um, uh, put it in a, on an SDS page to see uh, really the bands you have and uh, integer the, the bands you have to have an other values. And you see that ex uh, except uh, cross contaminations during the fractionation here and here, uh, or maybe uh, here it's it can be uh, very fast folding proteins that are prevented to go uh, uh, inside the, the periplasm after having fold, but it's uh, very unlikely. Uh, you have uh, again uh, other values to uh, prove that your protein is expressed in one on the or the other uh, uh, compartments. All right. Folding, that's uh, one of the most tricky one, but uh, to it's, it's tricky because it's very difficult to unfold the fluorescent proteins. Uh, if you uh, try to make an SDS page, I don't know if you already tried, but if you make an SDS page after uh, boiling your samples uh, in SDS and uh, beta, beta mercap to ethanol and whatever, you, uh, you make your gel and you put it uh, on a fluorescent plate, on a, a trans eliminator, uh, it will still glow a lot. So it's very difficult. And in fact, the, the common uh, urea test, you know, uh, with temperature and urea uh, doesn't work well. Uh, that's, uh, for example, a control. So you increase the temperature. So of course, since you increase your temperature, you have uh, everything uh, that drops a bit. Uh, so that's the control for temperature only, uh, if you follow uh, the absorption. And uh, that's the, mm, the with temperature plus 10 molar of urea. So that's a huge uh, amount. And still, there's barely any difference. So, uh, so it di didn't work e even over a over a weekend. Uh, but it works for some reason I don't know. Uh, but with uh, eight molar of guanidine, uh, one molar, one millimolar of DTT, and uh, and in a buffer, a uh, neutral buffer. So that time, if you, that that's not sufficient by itself. A caotrop is not sufficient for by itself. But if you eat at least for 10 minutes at 65 degrees in these conditions, then you'll end up eventually like that. Uh, that's after 20 minutes, in fact. But okay, um, 20 minutes, let's say, uh, and uh, it will drop efficiently uh, until reaching uh, nothing. So you completely unfold your proteins, and indeed, uh, really, there's nothing more in uh, inflorescence. Okay, you unfolded. Now you dilute 10 times uh, your proteins in a renaturation buffer. Uh, the recipe is given here, and you measure your fluorescent signal uh, still at the maximum peak every every minute during 20 minutes and hope that it will refold. So the we had to uh, to tune a bit our recipe by adding a 30% glycerol because for weak proteins, proteins that are uh, incapable of properly fold, uh, they were not folding at all. Uh, so with 30% glycerol it works uh, and they are all comparable. And that's uh, the, the example data points that we could have on a super folder, on RS folder and on a RSGFE2. Uh, these things uh, can be fitted by uh, this kind of um, uh, equation, uh, where uh, well, it's a long t, t is here, uh, and uh, with k the refolding rate, and tm that's the median uh, here uh, refolding time, and the lag time, which is here, that's the the time it takes for the protein to start really uh, folding, and you saw the animation uh, of Dominic uh, of the protein being refolded. Uh, in fact, the start is very um, the it's very efficient. Uh, the two first uh, strand in of a fluorescent protein is very uh, uh, fast to uh, to attach, but the rest is quite long. That's the la the lag time, and in fact, it was the key uh, for uh, fast folding proteins. Uh, having these two first uh, strands uh, stuck together, once they are stuck together, thermodynamically it will be very easy for the protein to uh, to fold. And uh, to do that, you have to uh, the key is to uh, remove or uh, make a mutation before any cysteine that will be on the first strand. Uh, because um, if you have cysteines uh, in the first strand, when they will go uh, into a very oxidative um, uh, environment, such, such as the uh, periplasm or, or the out outside uh, uh, world for, uh, for a bacterium, for example, uh, which is uh, about the same uh, content, then they will uh, start reacting with anything 
uh, and they will uh, make uh, disulfide bridges with everything and so it will prevent any um, any further folding of your, of your protein but uh, so uh, uh, there are two uh, mutations uh, each in front of uh, each uh, cysteine in superfolder you have another uh, protein that is working like that uh, where uh, there's no cysteine at all that's uh, mcherry which is derivative of uh, mrsp1 uh, so the monomeric version of uh, cherry uh, which is uh, uh, devoided of any uh, cysteine on the first strand and so that works as well that's the only other protein that i know that works well in uh, cytoplasm uh, periplasm sorry along with superfolder yeah Maybe, yeah, yeah. I think that all I, I think that all these well, well they, they are about uh, ah yeah you mean because here it's longer. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know because the the one that works the best uh, has the shortest uh, uh, delay time here uh, RS folder. But <laughs> in, in, in fact, uh, according to all the simulations, because, for example, the, the, this movie that Dominic showed, uh, that's a simulation of folding, you never see uh, the first uh, two strands uh, sticking together because it's that's already formed. It's so fast, uh, then, uh, then afterwards the, the rest is forming. The beta barrel is, is easy to form once these two uh, guys are uh, stuck together. So that's really the key. And if, you if ever these ones are, uh, because they are going through, uh, the signal rec recognition particle um, pathway, and if ever they are um, uh, going through that, uh, Philip Tinfeld showed that uh, if you uh, secrete this uh, uh, GFP into the periplasm and then you extract that and put it on a, on a gel, then you have a ladder of, uh, of uh, proteins. It will interact with every crap uh, you have uh, in the periplasm and you'll have a, a real ladder, uh, while uh, for a superfolder you have a neat band. Do Eric Snap's um, OxFPs work well in the periplasm? Have you looked at those? Uh, um, we <laughs> we didn't no, we didn't. Well, I didn't, but uh, yeah, the mox the mox denver too. Yeah. But he's he's made uh, like ox BFP, yeah, yeah. etc. Ah, ox yes. cerulean um, for mm. the ER. I mean, so yeah, yeah. he made them so that they wouldn't oligomerize in the ER. They're cysteine-less, but I, yes. I didn't know. Yeah, <laughs> so we they don't uh, necessarily we, we didn't fold fast. We didn't try in uh, such a, an oxidative uh, environment like the the periplasm. Uh, we have an someone who's working on Mox Denra two and Mox BFP maybe no, I don't know uh, for uh, the ER and the Golgi. Uh, it seems to work well, so we we, sh we shall try maybe uh, these ones. If but if it's without cysteine, so it's probably the same uh, story again. Yeah. That's really the key point uh, that we didn't know before starting this uh, thing. So with this um, uh, formula, you can uh, fit all these uh, parameters and have uh, the, the, the lag time and the, um, and the rate of refolding. So that's exactly what you want, I guess, uh, when you want to know the, the, folding, the folding of your uh, fluorescent protein. Uh, maturation of the chromophore, uh, it can be so that's the uh, that's the the maturation process, and whatever the order of uh, oxidation and dehydration that is uh, still uh, debated, I think uh, there are at least two uh, limiting uh, steps in maturation of the chromophore. That's the cyclization uh, process, that is the first step, and the oxidation, which is the second one. And in fact, uh, there are uh, either you can uh, uh, distinguish one from the other, so measure this one and measure this one or you can uh, measure the global uh, maturation time and then uh, one of the other and you'll, by su subtraction, you'll know the other one. Uh, so that's what I do. Uh, here, in, uh, in a f you grow 50 milliliter of bacterial cells, bacterial cultures, uh, in LB medium, uh, in, a, in a 250 milliliter flask. So the idea is having as much uh, oxygen as you can for uh, bacteria to grow. Uh, to an optical density of 0.6, uh, uh, of 0.6, then you don't go to the cinema. You add IPTG uh, as a pulse of expression because uh, that's only during uh, 30 minutes, and then you wash. 
so that's really a pulse and chase uh, stuff. You wash uh, with an antibiotic cocktail, which is uh, chloramphenicol, tetracycline, uh, and uh, your selection but, uh, an um, uh, antibiotic, which can be uh, most of the time uh, ampicillin. So the idea here is to uh, still have your uh, an uh, antibiotic selection, normal, but uh, this uh, cocktail uh, prevents any, um, uh, well they are bacteriostatic, so they will uh, stop the division and expression, but not the maturation of the already produced uh, proteins. Maturation will still go on. Uh, and immediately you start measuring the fluorescent signals because you're sure that what you will see from the, the zero uh, at the start of your measurement will be maturation of your protein because the, this cocktail will stop immediately uh, the, this, um, uh, translation, this expression, right? So you see, you follow uh, by uh, measuring uh, during uh, every 10 minutes, during eight hours. So that's what at, at 37 degrees, and that's why a uh, plate reader is recommended. Uh, you will see your increasing uh, uh, signal until reaching a plateau. And, and from that, again, you can feed uh, your sigmoidal and extract the rate of, um, of uh, maturation, global maturation, right? Uh, if we can measure one of the two uh, other well, on one of the two, then we can uh, distinguish the other, and that's what you can you can do uh, by uh, measuring uh, the last step, so the, well, the oxidation step at, step at least. Again, by growing a 50 milliliter of bacteria uh, in 250 milliliter flasks, add IPTG, but this time you transfer uh, all that immediately in a falcon tube of uh, 50 milliliter. Uh, so it's so 50 milliliter in 50 milliliter, even even a bit more actually. So that it's really uh, on the top. You close it tightly so that's absolutely no uh, air uh, staying. You put uh, everything you can around to uh, prevent any uh, oxygen coming. So th you form an, an anaerobic uh, uh, medium. So the bacteria will just have the choice to, uh, to have uh, the uh, dissolved uh, oxygen within the, the medium to survive. And even if they die, actually, if after a while, uh, it's not very really a problem because they will be induced already. So they will produce uh, proteins that you, you can uh, uh, retrieve afterwards. Uh, and af at four degree, anyway, you centrifuge cells, re resuspend res them in uh, lysis buffer, which is given here, antiprotease, well, you know that, uh, probably DNAs, and you syndicate everyone. Uh, you centrifuge very quickly, as, as quickly as you can, because uh, yeah, it's fast process. Uh, and you mix 50 mi microliters of uh, the supernatant with 200 mic microliters of that. And you measure fluorescent signal every 10 minutes, uh, again, during eight hours at 37 degrees. Still, a plate reader is recommended. And you'll have these kind of, of things uh, in time. So that's very, very nice. And that's only one step of, uh, of the um, maturation, which is the oxygen oxygenation uh, dependent uh, step. Maybe, maybe. Uh, I don't know. We, we go too fast to break them to measure it, uh, maybe, but we, we should maybe. You think it changes the the pH? Okay, possible. I don't know how it influences the. Yeah, yeah. But here it re it co correlates perfectly with what what we we see uh, that uh, superfolder is really the great uh, winner, but all the other uh, are uh, behaving the same way. Um, Ah, there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. For expression. Yeah. Uh, excitability of the of the chromophore. So it means uh, uh, the pKa. In fact, the determi determining the pKa precisely uh, because uh, it it will be what 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 you well, the the anionic uh, fraction will be the one you can excite. Uh, so th for y for the pKa, uh, I'm using the Williams method. So the Williams method is uh, that you um, uh, just uh, make a uh, take a many uh, uh, absorption spectra uh, in in uh, on on your protein. So you'll have again uh, the equili equilibrium uh, of uh, uh, neutral and uh, anionic for your protein. And if it's well made uh, with corri uh, corrections of uh, the baseline and everything, you'll have again the the isosbestic point between the two. 
and you go uh, like that as far as you can until you see a uh, degradation of your protein. That's the gray uh, spectrum because you see that it's going off of the, the, the isosbetic point and also off of the maximum. It's uh, more obvious uh, for sometimes. So it can be uh, either in the, um, in the um, protonated uh, way or in the acidic, but it works way more, uh, way, way better uh, here. Uh, so uh, in the um, going uh, from 3, let's say, 3.5, to uh, 9.5, that's uh, that's the maximum we could make, and that's uh, suggestion suggestions I make uh, because uh, on all the different buffers I tested, that's the one that uh, gave the best results. So citric acid, sodium acetate, mass, FS, and chess. Uh, so this measurement uh, that that allows you to get uh, this uh, kind of information. So the it's not dilution; it's just the protein that absorbs less and less uh, in the while the pH is uh, decreasing, and the fluorescence as well. And from that, again, you have data points that you can fit with a sigmoidal because uh, that's the sigmoidal uh, anderson alselbach uh, centrism. Yeah, here uh, equation. So it gives it depends on the on the concentration of uh, anionic and neutral uh, and and the pKa obviously. So those two you know, and so you'll uh, retrieve the pKa. Yes. Fifteen. Okay. <laughs> so fast. Uh, brightness. Oh. Brightness is determined by uh, the product of uh, quantum yield of fluorescence and excitation uh, extinction coefficient. So uh, that's what I say here. So you can obtain your uh, fluorescence quantum yield by uh, two methods, either by absolute methods and or by relative methods. I will explain to you. And the extinction coefficient. So uh, as uh, you heard uh, the first day, it, it's, uh, it represents. Uh, it has the same di dimension of a uh, surface uh, because uh, yeah molar we're using you we're used to uh, use this uh, this thing molar minus one centimeter minus one in uh, international system means uh, uh, this uh, the, the well, this unit <laughs> and so and so in in meter it in meter it ma it makes uh, square meters uh, and uh, if you have a TCS PC so time time correlated single photon counting to measure lifetimes and, and you can measure lifetime of your protein then you just have to uh, multiply your brightness so uh, your fr your quantum yield times your extinction extinction coefficient times your lifetime and you'll have your, your photon budget meaning all the photons yeah, that your protein holds uh, and that that it can give before uh, dying in average so uh, for absolute methods you need an integrating sphere uh, i don't know if you heard of that but uh, it's a sphere uh, so here, believe me or not, but the, the cube here is a sphere inside. It's <laughs> yeah, so it's a it's an included uh, embedding embedded uh, sphere uh, that you can put directly in a um, in a spectrophotometer uh, and fluorometer, and you have this uh, holder here where you can put a tube um, with your protein inside. So it's a round, uh, it's a cylind cylindrical uh, tube uh, where you can put your samples and put it in in and or out, as you can see, of the direct beam. So the tube is here and is here when you put it out. Uh, because the inside of the, of, the, um, of the sphere is coated with the barium sulfate. So it's very, very uh, um, reflective uh, layer that uh, essentially is considered as perfect uh, layer for uh, light. So it will uh, uh, split the light everywhere, uh, reflect the light everywhere, and eventually it, it will be de detected by the, the detector. Uh, so if you put the tube out of the, of the beam, you'll have only the, the direct uh, excitation, and it will give you, so you put a tube of OD minus uh, below 0.1. Very often students uh, put their uh, much higher concentration, like uh, uh, almost one of OD for fluorescence, uh, take care of the uh, inner filtering effect you'll have a biased uh, result, so otherwise it means that your proteins uh, beside can reabsorb uh, the, the fluorescence. Uh, so when, when it's out of the beam, uh, within the sphere, you'll just have the diffused uh, rays and you'll have this incident photon peak. Uh, and if you take the, the uh, uh, rhea below, you'll have the rhea from the incident light. Okay. <laughs> uh, if you put uh, the tube within the direct beam, then take another measure and you'll have these uh, two peaks which is uh, here, and this that corresponds to the your spectrum of uh, emission, emission spectrum, and uh, you have uh, areas that correspond to the area of the, scat of the scattered uh, light, so unabsorbed light scattered from the sample, and area that is emitted from the sample. 
Uh, and believe me or not, but it's as simple as making this uh, uh, calculation. So area uh, of the incident light minus the area of the emitted sample, uh, emitted from the sample over the area of uh, incident light, and you have the continuum in absolute way. Right? Go fast. Uh, up. Next one is the relative uh, method, where you can um, compare your uh, quantum yield unknown to a known uh, reference. And very often, uh, the reference is uh, the fluorescent for green uh, FPs. So you put your fluorescent in uh, 1.1 molar uh, NaOH, uh, and uh, it will give you a quantum yield of 0.92, which is uh, quite uh, uh, known. And with, with this qu qu calculation, you can have the qu quantum yield of your uh, protein, because you know the refracti re refractive index uh, of uh, NaOH, well, that's water. And uh, in your protein, if it's water uh, as well, so it's one. Uh, and you have uh, your uh, uh, terms here, which are essentially the slopes of your um, uh, data points measured, where you have uh, taken the integrated fluorescence uh, peak that are coming from a single measurement. So you put your protein at uh, an OD below uh, 0.2 or yeah, like that. And you dilute because y you can you can measure uh, measure it still quite precisely 0.2. You dilute t it yet another 10 times to uh, so you take sorry you take the measurements of uh, of these guys and you dilute it in, in series. So you take 0.2 and then uh, you dilute uh, uh, by two again. You measure dilute by two again and so on. So you uh, you'll have this uh, kind of absorbance uh, um, scale. And uh, you dilute it 10 times again to, in to avoid the uh, inner filtering uh, uh, effects. And you take the emission spectrum of all these samples, uh, but taking care of uh, exciting it way below uh, the, the excitation uh, maximum. Otherwise, you'll, uh, you'll cut your uh, emission spectrum and you'll, you'll be biased by uh, having uh, half of your uh, emission spectrum that, that is lacking because of the incident light. So you take it, for example, if it's uh, something that is uh, emitting at 500 nanometer and, s and further, you measure, for example, at 460, right? That's a good, uh, good estimation. And then uh, you'll uh, report the, the integrity, the fluorescence, so below the, the emi emission uh, peak, uh, uh, regarding uh, versus the, the absorbance, and you ha you'll have a slope. So this slope uh, is uh, corresponds to, uh, on your reference to the quantum yield of 0.92, and then you have to make a very complicated uh, how do you say uh, uh, cross calculation to uh, to come back to your uh, quantum yield uh, of um, knowing the slope of the two other or, or, or the other uh, proteins? Well, if it's not clear, you ask questions afterwards. Extinction coefficients. We use the Watts method, which consists in uh, very often uh, people take the the uh, uh, theoretical value at two and two and uh, 280 nanometer and say, okay, my protein is here. Uh, but it depends uh, really of the on the um, purity of your sample, and it's not uh, specific of your protein, and it's theoretical. Here you have an absolute method to, uh, to determine your protein uh, extinction coefficient, your uh, chromophores uh, extinction coefficient. You completely denature uh, the protein by adding more and more and more uh, NaOH uh, uh, concentration uh, volumes. So you add it until uh, reaching this value, which, which will be uh, the same uh, spectrum, whichever the fluorescent protein uh, it is. So whichever uh, protein uh, and wherever it, uh, it absorbs initially, here or there or whatever, it will end up here uh, be because the, the chemical moiety of the chromophore is the same. So you, you just uh, remove all its uh, environment within the chromophore you put it naked, finally, completely uh, uh, exposed to the solvent, and it will absorb the same way with the same extinction coefficient, which has been uh, reported by Watts uh, in 80-something, uh, 80 81, uh, to be 44,000 molar minus 1 centimeter minus 1 at 447 nanometer. And from that, you, m you can make again yet another uh, cross-calculation to come back to your initial uh, um, uh, extinction coefficient with whatever the the pH, right? Uh, and the last is the the evaluate the phototransformation bleaching quantum yields. Uh, so in fact, you can 
estimate all these uh, bleach, uh, quantum mid switching, bleaching, switching, and uh, switching speed, uh, switching contrast and switching spe speed with only one um, uh, good measurement, which is the photofatigue. If you have a sorry a, a, a fluorescent protein that is uh, reversibly switchable, obviously, uh, you make uh, photofatigue cycles like that. So here it's quite a lot. Uh, each time you don't see, but uh, that's a zoomed one. Uh, you see that's shark fins, so it's going on and off and on and off, uh, thousands of times. And uh, uh, in in reality, it looks like that. So you uh, you you superimpose uh, uh, superimpose a 400 and 405 sorry nanometer light violet light and uh, cyan light to uh, well first sorry you switch off the protein with 405 488 nanometer so it will decrease in density and then uh, you you put back uh, the protein its own state uh, by uh, eliminating it at 405 nanometer if you remember uh, the switching uh, uh, mechanism uh, but by putting by doing that you need as well the 488 uh, nanometer to f to track the the emission otherwise you don't see uh, you don't see it so you're obliged to put both and in that case uh, it means that in in this region you under evaluate the um, the real uh, the real the real intensity because you have two uh, uh, two lasers that push in the opposite direction uh, so you you wha what you'll see is a steady state of the of the real uh, um, kinetics uh, so if it's true, then it means that the very first point must be much much higher than the others, uh, because it hasn't seen uh, four or five nanometer uh, light yet, and then it will reach a steady state uh, that uh, has to be taken into account in a in a process. So uh, this is uh, solved by a kinetic model uh, of two one with these uh, values. And if you have questions, please uh, ask uh, Dominic. <laughs> <laughs> because he wrote uh, a MATLAB routine uh, to do that, uh, but the the idea is that uh, the excitation excitation rate uh, depends on the exci excitation coefficient by this relation. So here you have the the rate that that you're interested in for each uh, given state, so uh, on to off or off to on, uh, and uh, and you you need the excitation co extinction coefficient. Uh, so that's why it's important to uh, to be able to measure it precisely. <coughs> That's the, the 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 different terms in the in the equation, and uh, from a single uh, so here you can see that the indeed the first point is much higher than the other, because it hasn't seen a uh, four or five nanometer yet, so it's just switching away, so it's switching off. Sorry, <laughs> and then uh, you have this uh, steady state, so uh, the protein will just uh, uh, go as as th at this uh, level uh, afterwards like that, um, and well modulo the the bleaching of course uh, that can occur. And so since the bleaching can occur that you saw on the previous slide here, that's bleaching, it means that you, you're able with a single pro, uh, for, um, photofatigue experiment to extract the bleaching quantum yield, uh, bleaching speed, uh, and uh, the um, uh, on and off uh, quantum yields of switching as well. Uh, so you need for that to precisely know the, the concentration, so it means extinction coefficient of your protein, uh, the extinction coefficient of each state, the the power densities of your uh, of e each of your lasers, and uh, that's it, I think. Yes, and you can extract all these uh, all these values. So to improve things, uh, you can make many uh, different ways of uh, to m mutate uh, your protein. I don't have time left, right? Okay. <laughs> So uh, it's good that I just wanted to talk about this one. That's the saturated mutagenesis, uh, and that requires uh, an in-depth knowledge of the structure of your protein. But you can, of course, uh, you know probably uh, semi-random mutations uh, with mega primers that you mutate and insert in your things. Quick change, which, I which is the, the best well-known uh, uh, way of making point mutation. But that's always point mutation, and you can uh, just uh, uh change one amino acid to a uh, given other one, but what if you uh, identified on the structure a uh, given position that you want to uh, mutate for whatever uh, comes? Th there's a very easy way to do it uh, that I like. It's uh, using degenerated uh, codons uh, for saturation mutagenesis. Uh, in fact, you get to know that uh, when you order your primers, if you are the primers, you can not only uh, use ATCNG, but also uh, all these letters that are given here, given here, 
uh, that are, for example, W for weak, which is uh, giving you uh, uh, the same proportion of A and T, because it's weak interactions, strong, C and G, S. Uh, you have uh, all, all the other ones. Uh, so they are coding for uh, one, two, three, four uh, combinations different. And instead of having the classical N, N, N that you might know, uh, that gives you uh, uh, the same proportion of A, T, C, and G, uh, doing that, like many other peop many people do, uh, you'll have you end up with the with the degenerated uh, codon in in whole. So it means that it give it doesn't give you the same uh, chance to have any uh, mutation, and it will give you a lot of chance to have a. Uh, uh, old codons like uh, alanine or this kind, of kind of things like that, or new codons like uh, a new uh, uh, amino acids like uh, tryptophan, which is only coded by one uh, codon, and it will give you all the chances to have the three stopped codons. So, uh, so maybe you want to avoid that, and you can do it, for example, by this uh, combination of uh, codons when you order. It's the same price if you <laughs> if you order. Uh, no, it's important to know because uh, you can order. It's the cheapest uh, way of uh, mutate mutate that I could find. Uh, here, for example, you order only three codons, which is in fact not three codons, but three mix of codons. DBG, that will code for all these uh, amino acids. Uh, WDC, that will code for all those. And VAK, that will code for all that. So it's almost uh, one um, amino, am amino acid per codon uh, that you'll order. So it gives you uh, almost the same chance for uh, everyone, except these two that are redundant. But you'll avoid all the proline, which is not an amino acid, but an amino acid, uh, and uh, it will give you uh, no uh, <laughs> no stop codons as well. So you'll uh, you'll end up with all the chances you want, or you can even uh, tweak a tweak it a bit to not having uh, your initial uh, uh, amino acid and be sure that you mutate it, for example. And for a given uh, example, if you have to uh, a single, you have a single primer, for example, holding uh, two mutations uh, that are side by side. Uh, you can do it, and uh, it will give you, uh, with the, the equip probability of the three degenerated codon uh, shown above, uh, nine combinations uh, uh, that are possible. So nine primers to, uh, to order instead of three, which are these uh, these combinations: dbg, dbg, and uh, okay, all the all the different combinations, and with re respectively uh, nine, six, here yeah, nine, six, six uh, different codons in each mix. So you'll have. Uh, nine, fi nine, nine times nine, nine times six, and so on, uh, combinations. So that gives you a theoretical uh, po a capability of generating 439, so because you have two redundant different mutants from nine primers only. So that's 40 euro, maybe. Uh, and for that, you just have to uh, uh, order your primer uh, with two degenerated codons and uh, uh, that contains 44, 54 different types of primers. Uh, and you put it, so for example, if they were generated at uh, synthesized at uh, 43 um, uh, nanomole, that I, I took the uh, real example of what, th what they gave me, uh, <laughs> then it means that you have a 0.2 nanomole of each type of primers because you have 54 primers in, in your tube. And you and uh, you want uh, you want them at uh, 100 picomol per uh, microliter, so you know uh, which uh, amount uh, to put. So you dilute accordingly. And you put five microliters of that with ATP and T for uh, phospho whatever kinase, <laughs> PNK, uh, at uh, uh, 37 uh, degrees during one hour. So it will phosphorylate your uh, primers. That's important step. Uh, and then you uh, make a normal PCR, except that you tweak it by adding. Um, uh, you put a uh, high fidelity uh, polymerase because you, you don't want uh, to make a prone uh, error prone uh, p uh, PCR, but you add a uh, ligase inside. And normally, uh, common ligase like uh, TAC ligase or whatever, or T4, uh, are, use are generally uh, uh, inactive at high temperature. This one, 9 degree north, that's the opposite. It was found in Thermococcus uh, and it's uh, only active uh, above 45 uh, degrees. So it means that during the cycles, while uh, your, your uh, um, polymerase is uh, active and will uh, amplify your, uh, your uh, uh, single strand because uh, there's only one primer, okay? that's why you have to put a lot of uh, DNA, uh, template DNA. So uh, yeah, instead of having, uh, you, you put 10 times more uh, DNA because it's uh, less uh, efficient when you have one primer instead of two. So it, uh, you put 10, 10 times more DNA uh, and uh, you'll have a single strand that is uh, being formed here. And then when it's uh, divided, your ligase uh, will be uh, active and 
will uh, cyclize uh, your uh, mutated uh, primer. And then it will anneal again, and so on, and uh, the primers will uh, come back. So that generates one direct uh, strand, uh, mutated and, um, and uh, cyclized. But then you have to g generate the other one, no problem. You uh, take your, your tube out of the PCM machine, you put DPN1 that only cleaves uh, methylated DNA, so meaning uh, your template DNA, not, not the one generated by uh, the, mu the PCR. You digest it, uh, and all these um, little um, pieces of uh, the template DNA will serve as as many uh, numbers of uh, uh, primers. And there's very, very uh, few chances to uh, regenerate uh, the uh, mutated templates. Uh, so uh, you will uh, generate the, the, the corresponding other uh, mutated uh, strand and eventually you'll, f you'll have your, uh, all your, mut your mutant at once that you'll need to plate, for example here, that's uh, one of my examples. So you have uh, many, many clones, so you'll have to spread it uh, on many uh, different uh, uh, plates because 439 is uh, way more, uh, way too much uh, for one, uh, one plate. It doesn't need doesn't mean that of course you'll uh, generate all of them because uh, some uh, will not survive some will not and a lot will not be fluorescent for example that's the corresponding uh, number of clones that are fluorescent and so you can screen like that the number of clones that are fluorescent for if it's what interests you or or that are switchable or that are of a different color or that are positive positive switches or and you can color code for example uh, by uh, recognition particle uh, tracking softwares uh, your different clones and see uh, the ones that are interested to, uh, to be uh, picked and um, uh, sequenced, right? So that was an example, but it's not very int interesting. Uh, here we, mutate we, we had this structure and we wanted to mutate three different uh, mu uh, positions, one, two, and three. <laughs> so we got uh, 49 uh, interesting mutants we wanted to test, so we uh, ordered the primers accordingly. And we had, uh, in fact, uh, uh, four 19, I don't remember, 19 mutants that were in really interesting. The time is over. Yes. Uh, <laughs> my presentation as well. So uh, we, we just uh, tested them all, or 11 maybe, I don't know. So you see that uh, we are interested in switching speed, so they it works. And we uh, took the, the two extreme um, uh, mutants, so the slowest and the fastest uh, here, and we see you see here all the different uh, uh, parameters that I talked about, so uh, sorry it's in French, but uh, uh, excitation maxima, uh, coefficient extinction coefficient, quantum yield of fluorescence, PK, brightness, uh, contrast, speed of switching, and we crystallized them, solved the structures, so all the three uh, mutations, of course, could understand what happened uh, within the structure. That suggested new mutations to do, and that's another story. So I'll stop there. And thanks, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate. <laughs> So thank you for a very nice presentation. Are there any questions? One or two? When you look when you look at folding, um, you have the mature protein, you denature it and then you let it refold. Do you think there's a difference with the, fold, uh, with the folding from the native state? Because in one case you look at the readily uh, existing COM4, and in the other case um, obviously there's a difference in the primary um, structure. Will that make a difference in folding speed? Probably it does, yeah. Uh, it's true that we are not uh, looking at folding but refolding. That's what we call actually <laughs> re refolding. Uh, yeah, uh, I have to think of that and make uh, <laughs> another protocol to try uh, directly uh, probing the, f the real initial folding uh, by blocking the cyclization, for example. It's not easy, but indeed you're, you're right. You have first to, uh, to wait until this uh, first uh, cyclization is made. Um, I don't know, I don't know what to answer because I, I don't know how to do it at the moment. That's the best we can do. At, at least, sorry, at least we compare them together, so they, sh they should behave the same concerning the barrel itself, uh, even if the, cycli the maturation itself is a, li a limiting point. Once it's made, uh, the, the folding itself uh, should be comparable uh, between all the different proteins. 
gives you an idea uh, about uh, how your probe behaves. So related to this question, and um, <laughs> so in your case, uh, the you are confirming that after the denaturing, you lose the fluorescence. Yeah. But how do you know that this is really reducing the structures? Because uh, that just a small change in the conformation can already lose the fluorescence. It's true. It's true. Uh, uh, well, let's say that it's uh, corroborating b corrob corroborated by uh, the, the values we find in literature uh, for uh, ref refolding uh, because it's very long. If it was a subtle uh, change, like a torsion, or I, I would expect uh, that it doesn't take, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, hours to, to come back. Here it's really, well, and Honestly, uh, if it doesn't uh, unfold, uh, we, we could probably uh, probe it by, anim I don't know, NMR or whatever, <laughs> if it's completely uh, unfolding. Uh, well, I have to ask the NMR specialist here. But uh, um, wi with a strong calotropic uh, uh, agent plus uh, thermal um, treatment, I have a, s a suspicion that it's, uh, that it's indeed unfolding, but you're right, we might prove it by uh, trying to probe the structure uh, changes, indeed. Um, maybe also a question which is not so easy to answer, <laughs> but <laughs> I refuse. If, if somebody has a recommendation, maybe you. I was just wondering if you have a recommendation for people who want to, uh, I don't know, design and test flow force, which are actually photoactivatable, so you can't probe the fluorescence along all these steps to, to measure um, I don't know, folding efficiency, etc. because the first state would be dark. Uh, well, there are many. <laughs> yeah. Hmm? Yeah, you can make it first, uh, well, activate it first <laughs> in, in the tube. Why not? Why not? It's the best uh, you can do. And most of the, well, yeah, m most of the techniques I think uh, I presented are uh, based on uh, absorption. But it's the same. Uh, no, no, no. Absorption is it, it's absorbing anyway, so it's it's okay. It's only the few uh, that depends on fluorescence. Then you have to activate uh, your protein prior uh, to experiment. Doesn't seem uh, it's in the tube anyway, so no. Do you see uh <laughs> problems with that? Um, do you want questions here? No, it's it's okay. Okay, it's okay. <laughs> so thank you. And I think it's a break, time for coffee break.